Okay, so I started up a brand new scene here, and in this video, what I'm going to do is show you how simulations work and uh, how these environments for simulations work inside of ICE and Exercise 7. So let's just go ahead and jump in here and get started. First thing I need to do is open up an Explorer view, so I'll hit 8 on the keyboard to do that. Now I'll come over here to the uh, where it says Scene Root, and I'll switch the scope over to Environments. And once I do that, you should see this Environments uh, folder up here, and there's nothing in here. The reason for that is it's empty. There's no uh, simulation environments in our scene right now because we just created this, and we haven't made any simulations yet. So what is an environment uh, inside of XSI? Well, environments contain everything pertaining to simulations, including a few key uh, nodes that you need to be able to have simulations. Without those nodes, you wouldn't be able to have simulations in the XSI. So how do we create these uh, simulation environments? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. All you have to do is create something with ice. So let's go to primitive, polygon mesh, and we'll get ourselves a maybe a grid this time. Okay, so here's our grid. Every time you take an, uh, an object or something in XSI 7, and you go up here to ICE and you create a, an ICE simulation, you notice something that happened over here. Now, there's an environment that was created for us. And by default, it's called environment. And inside this environment, there's a few things in here. There's this cache node, and we'll talk about that later on in a, in a video, uh, probably after this one. Then we have also a simulation time control, and this special node controls a lot of things that pertain to our simulation, as we can see here, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. And then we have a forces group over here, and the forces group is uh, every time we create a new force in our scene, the force will be applied automatically inside this forces group because this is the current environment that's active right now. So, if, for example, we come over here and we go to get force, and then we grab ourselves, say, gravity. When we create that gravity force in our scene, you'll notice now that inside the forces group, XSI went ahead and placed our gravity uh, that we created inside of that forces group. So I'll just take that gravity and delete it since we don't need it right now. Uh, but at least you see how that works. And it's very important to understand these uh, simulation environments because, well, they control your simulation in your scene. And if you don't control them, how can you possibly control your simulation? See where I'm going with this? Okay, so now let's have a closer look at uh, the simulation time control here that controls the simulation of this environment. So I'll click on the little gradient icon to open up its PPG. Alternatively, I could have also selected the name here and hit enter on the keyboard to open up its PPG. Okay, I'll just pin that down. And we have two simple tabs here. Uh, when it comes to caching, we'll talk about that in the next video. In this one, I just want to focus on these uh, simulation controls over here. Okay. We play the simulation, pretty much what you would expect happens. The particles are, are uh, emitted, they're simulated in the scene all the way up to frame 100. So let's go ahead and let's do this. Let's switch over to 1000 frames, but before I do that, I want you to notice some options here. We have these options for scene time, and it has a checkbox uh, mark for use start frame and one for use end frame. Okay, when I have those. Uh, those options turned on what happens is that XSI goes okay so your frame range goes from frame 1 to frame 100 so we'll make the simulation last uh, about 99 frames because 1 to 100 is 99 frames that's why you see the number 99 over here in the duration and it's grayed out we can't affect it right now because we have these options turned on so if for example I go ahead and I change my frame range here to 1000 and I hit enter, you notice now the duration over here updated. Now it says 999. So these options here pretty much tell uh, simulation to go ahead and copy the numbers from down here automatically whenever I change them. Now if I take these options off, now I can go ahead and manually set the time reference over here. So I could tell it uh, manually what frame to offset it from. So I could offset it uh, one frame which is the default I can also tell it what duration over here to use so I can tell it to have a duration of 100 frames or I can tell it to have a duration of 10,000 frames whatever I want and then down here where it's grayed out it'll say the uh, current simulation frame which is currently uh, frame 100 then we have these two buttons down here copy from scene and copy to scene what these allow us to do 
is copy the numbers back and forth between the scene and the simulation PPG. So let's have a look at that. If I hit the copy from scene button, what will happen is uh, the information or the frame ranges that are down here in the lower interface in the animation playback controls will be copied over to this uh, simulation PPG. So right now we can see that the offset set to 1, duration is set to 100. But uh, down here my frame range says from frame 1 to 1000. So if I hit this button copy from scene, now you can see that the numbers were copied over. So now the, the duration is 999 frames, which matches up with my frame range down here in, uh, in the interface. Now, if I want to change things around, however, for example, if I, uh, if I change this uh, duration back to say 100 or whatever number I want, I'll just use 100 for the moment. Now you can see my frame range is still at 1 and 1000. But if I come up here and I hit this button that says copy to scene, this information inside the PPG will be copied over to the scene. So let's hit that button. And now you can see my frame range changed. And now my frame range goes from frame 1 to 101, which makes a duration of 100 frames. Okay. That brings us down to the, the actual play mode. And if we go here to this drop down box, we'll see we have three different play modes standard, live, and interactive. The default play mode is live. Let's leave it on live for the moment and let me go ahead and adjust some of these parameters up here. What I'll do is I'll check on use start frame and use end frame so it goes back to the default behavior. And I'm just going to take my time slider here and push it all the way up to 1000. So now this uh, animation goes from frame 1 to 1000. I also want to turn on this looping button down here so it loops over and over again, makes things easier for me. Let's go back to the first frame of the animation. And what we'll do now is we'll just hit play. Select these particles here. We can now close this PPG over here, by the way. So, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Explore window, go ahead and close that. Let's also, with the part, uh, point cloud selected, hit Alt and 9 to open up the ice tree. Double click on the Emit from Surface node. We can close the ice tree now. I'm going to pin down this uh, PPG. And we're going to make some changes here. First of all, let's switch the shape from point to sphere so we can see what's going on here. Let's also switch the shaded mode options up here to shaded. So there we go. Now we have little spheres. Let's take the size and increase it a bit. Okay, there we go. So what is the play mode called live? Well, in live play mode, every time I make a change, as you can see when I change the size of the particles, for example, the change is updated at the next frame. So as the simulation plays, every time I make a change, the next frame in the simulation inherits the change, and I can see it update in the viewport. But you'll notice that only new particles that are created inherit the change. Old particles that are already floating and are seen up here don't uh, take the change into account. They stay the same size they were before. Only the brand new particles that are created at new frames inherit the new size or the new color or whatever uh, parameter I changed in the PPG, in this case the size. So that's the main thing to remember about uh, live mode. Also, notice that when the animation gets to the end and it loops back to the first frame, the particles stop emitting and start emitting all over again. So you notice right now when I get to the end, the particles stop and then it starts over uh, all over again. So let's go ahead and switch the play mode over here from live to standard and see how that works. Okay, so here's standard. You're going to notice there's a huge difference with live and standard. The first uh, difference you'll notice when you start moving these sliders around is that every time you make a change, you get all this calculation that happens. So standard mode actually uh, behaves a little bit slower than live mode. And you'll also notice something else. When I change the size of these particles, at the next frame, all of the particles change in size. Not just the new particles that are being created down here, but all the particles that are already shot in the scene also change size. So it works a little bit different than live in that sense, where um, all the particles will inherit the changes, and those changes will be calculated down here. And that's the reason why every time I make a change, you'll notice that it has to re-simulate the frames and calculate um, from scratch, basically up to that frame that I'm at right now. So this mode is great for when you're going to do your your final render and you're, you're doing a motion blur and things like that. However, when you're doing some testing and you're still setting up your, your particles or your simulation, standard mode may be a, a little bit too slow to use 
uh, in regards to tweaking and stuff like that. So I would stay away from it during the tweaking and testing phases. Okay, now let's have a look at interactive mode. And in interactive mode can be a lot of fun. If you notice when I change the size of particles, it behaves just like live mode. Only the brand new particles that are created uh, after the current frame inherit the change, while the old particles in the scene just are pretty much left alone. So it works kind of like live, right? Well, it works a little bit differently, actually. Watch what happens when the uh, animation slider over here gets to the end of the animation and loops again. Hmm. Didn't exactly do what I expected it to, so we're going to edit that out of the video. Okay, starting again. Three, two, one. So the interactive mode is, as the name suggests, it's very, very interactive. We can, it's very, very interactive. We can, for example, take this, uh, this emitter down here and we can move it around and the particles will behave accordingly. Okay, starting again with interactive mode in three, two, one. And the interactive mode is, is great whenever you're working with simulations with uh, rigid bodies and dynamics. You can actually move objects around and uh, have them act and react realistically inside of your viewport. Okay, then over here finally we have this option for toggle simulation info. When you turn this on, what happens is you turn on some uh, useful information down here in your viewport about the current simulation. For example, the start frame, the end frame, and it'll also let you know if the caching is turned on or off. It's turned off by default, and we'll talk about caching for these simulations in the next video. Okay, if we hit this button again, we'll toggle that, uh, that info off of your viewport in case you don't want it. There's also this button up here called active, and if we uncheck that, it deactivates the simulation. So this can be very useful if you're working in a pretty big scene here and say there's a character running around who's on fire. Well, after you set up the fire, maybe you want to work on the animation a bit or something else. And you can't have these particles simulating while you're trying to work on some other simulations or maybe you're animating a character or something like that. So you can just deactivate the simulation while you work and just keep working on the other, uh, other parts of your project. And then later on for the render, of course, you could come back and activate this again and render out your final project okay now let's talk about setting the initial state so what's the initial state well if I go back to the first frame of the animation right now this is pretty much the initial state of my uh, particles here okay the initial state is just the uh, the first state that the simulation is going to begin with at the first frame okay so I'm at frame one and this is what I have so what I'll do is I'll select these uh, point cloud the point cloud the particles and I'll go over here to the ice menu and I can go to edit and set initial state so for example say if I wanted the simulation to not start off like this you see how it's starting off uh, coming off of the grid maybe I'm doing a fire effect or something or smoke and when the animation begins the smoke has to already be there at its full glory so it has to be something like this well I can go all the way to this uh, frame in the simulation, select the point cloud here of the particles, then I can just go to the edit menu under ice and just set initial state. Now if I go back to the first frame of the animation, you'll notice that the simulation begins at this frame. So as soon as I start hitting play from the first frame, my particles are already emitted at the state that I wanted it to. And that's the initial state. So it's extremely useful. Uh, for working with particles and ice. Okay, so that's going to do it for this video. In the next video, we'll cover caching, and we'll discover how caching can make simulations uh, run lightning fast.